tell us how did you get into that singing trio and tell us a little bit about where that took you uh, up to and including uh, meeting my mother uh, on and uh, at one of those gigs well it it was quite bizarre i was just talking to one of the fellows that was in the group about three days ago and i asked him he, he was also from bc and i asked him how did we ever decide to travel from winfield in uh, little old okanagan uh, to toronto and he couldn't quite remember the details either but it happened uh, i you know i just finished university uh, he happened to mention he was driving across the country in his blue Volkswagen. I said, I'll oh, come along and share the costs. And uh, I, got to, uh, I got to Toronto. He had an uncle here that he went and stayed with. I had a couple of friends that I'd met in UBC that were down at McMaster. So I went down to McMaster and for the next month or two, uh, maybe three, uh, drank a lot of beer probably. And... Uh, <laughs> Then in November, I got a call from uh, Steve, uh, Rhett, he's called, he had to change his name when he went to Nashville. Rhett Davis is his name now. And uh, he uh, said he just met somebody in Toronto who was looking for a couple of singers. And uh, the fellow's name was Harry Harding. And Harry had been with a group called The Highlights for six years. And they'd been fairly successful. They'd uh, been in Las Vegas on stage with Donald O'Connor, whom nobody would remember now probably, but a uh, uh, very good entertainer. Um, and they had been traveling for six years. So two of the guys uh, were had had enough of the travel and they were planning to uh, leave the group at, after a New Year's Eve show uh, that year. And so um, uh, Harry, hadn't heard Rhett sing. He, he didn't ask to hear me sing. Uh, Rhett vouched for me, and I think uh, Harry's uncle sort of vouched for uh, Steve's or Rhett's uncle. And uh, so I, I ended up driving up in a, one Friday in November, and again, we consumed a fair bit of beer and listened to the album that they had cut. And the next morning I said, yeah, I think I'll join the group. And so we worked uh, for six weeks to try and put together some of the charts they had. They had an arranger in Toronto, a guy who did some fabulous arrangements. And the arrangements were done from anywhere from a uh, trio, uh, 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 instrumental trio, up to about 15, 16 piece orchestra. Um, so we had to learn some of that. And I could read music. Uh, a little bit. I wasn't great by any means, but I'd taken some piano lessons, so uh, I could I could read some of these charts, and uh, I could often once we got going, I would often help uh, uh, rehearse the band before our show. And uh, anyway, uh, to go back to that November, uh, we worked for six weeks or so. And uh, early in January, probably around the end of the first week in January, we opened in Tel Aviv at the Sheraton Hotel in Tel Aviv. And Harry was uh, kind of uh, pretty worried on the flight over there because we really only had about a half hour show put together. Mm -hmm. We could maybe add another five or 10 minutes. But he, he stopped at the manager's office in the hotel while Rhett and I went up to our rooms. And when he came up, he was smiling like a Cheshire cat. Uh, the manager said, no more than 30 minutes a night. Because <laughs> an Italian band playing in the lounge as well. And they uh, wanted uh, that band to, you know, to have lots of activity. And it was a very popular spot, uh, the Sheraton Lounge in Tel Aviv. We were there for a month, and uh, by the time we finished there, because we would go down to the uh, lounge every afternoon when it was empty, and we would work on our act. And by the time we left there, we had about an hour's worth of material. We subsequently went up to a hotel in, in Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, and then we uh, did a big show in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, when we left there, it was about two months we'd been there. 
we went to New York and we did an audition for an agent in New York that our manager in Toronto had set up. And sure enough, uh, we had a whole bunch of jobs from that point on in New York and area, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, lots, lots of uh, Long Island, clubs in Long Island and so on. And uh, over the next uh, four years, five years, we ended up, uh, and I'm not sure any of your viewers would remember this, but it was an area called the, the uh, Borscht Belt. It was the Jewish Catskill Mountains. There were about 20 to 25 large clubs, two biggest being the Concord, uh, which had a nightclub that seated about 3,000 people, and Grossingers, which had a little smaller uh, club. But all of these clubs had professional musicians playing the band, and they had uh, comics, they had singers, uh, people coming in that you would have seen on television in the 60s and 70s as well. And uh, we, we opened for some, we closed uh, for others. And uh, um, Chris was born, of course, and spent several time, uh, several summers in the Catskills. Because uh, I met Pat, my first wife, uh, in New York City uh, very early on after we got there. She was in, in the ball. she was in, in the audience at a bar show, wasn't she? Is that the story? No, no, she wasn't really. Uh, you oh. remember Howie, of course, and Howie was a bartender, and uh, we we were staying in a hotel right on Broadway, and Fifty Fourth Street, and on Eighth Avenue, just a block away, there was a bar called the Triple M, and. Uh, we used to go there after our shows because, you know, if you've done a show at 10, 11 o'clock, you drive back to New York, you get there about one o'clock, you're, you're not ready to go to sleep. So we, the bars in New York stayed open until four and often they'd just shut the door. And if there were friends, friends of the bar owner, you could stay till five or six. And uh, so, and that's where I met your mother. Uh, at the bar one night and uh, she was lovely and uh, went out with her for a week and proposed to her uh, a week later. Wow. And, uh, we got married and uh, Chris came along and then Jamie came along and then many years later you came along. Right. So after the two weeks of uh, the week of, after being engaged, how long until the wedding? Uh, about three months, I think. Three months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We had to set up, uh, get somebody to, well, we had somebody that was going to do the catering for us. Unfortunately, about two or three days before the wedding was supposed to happen, he backed out. Oh. Uh, we were very lucky. We'd met a restaurant owner in the Bahamas, actually, uh, okay. because we, we did, we did a, a circuit of Hilton hotels in, in the Caribbean. Um, that first year, I think it was. And uh, we met Johnny Delustro, who owned an Italian restaurant on, I think it was 47th Street, uh, just off 7th Avenue. And uh, he came through. We met, we called him and said, we're, we're not sure what to do, Pat and I. We've, we've lost our caterer and we don't have a room. And he said, leave it to me. The whole restaurant became ours for the afternoon, and uh, he put on the spread food and the drinks, and uh, it was wonderful. Just yeah. amazing. We, we, had a show, lunch. we had a show that night, too, so we had to drive to the Catskill. So the wedding was, I think, around noon or 1 o'clock. Then we went to the restaurant and had guests there and had dinner in the afternoon. And then we had to jump in the car and head up to the Catskills, which is about a two-hour drive, rehearse the band when we got there, and do a show. But uh, my dad came with it, me, your grandfather, Lars, and my sister. They were both in town for the wedding. And I, I, I've never seen my dad uh, quite as loopy as he was on the champagne <laughs> he was drinking in that pub. 